Yeah, I love working with uh, with mixed teams because I find that uh, uh, women uh, provide so much more empathy and a different perspective uh, to men in those teams. Um, that may sound a, a little bit strange, but um, you know, when you're working on, on data science problems, very often you have to include societal impacts. And so it's really important that you do not just have men or just white men <laughs> uh, in those teams because they tend to look at issues from their own particular point of view. Uh, and the questions that we're trying to answer in data science, they, uh, they are important to everybody. And you know, 50% of the world is, uh, is female um, and we're not all white. Um, and so it's really, really good to have that input directly at the, when we're formulating questions, also when we're, when we're uh, designing uh, approaches to answer questions and otherwise uh, it will be too narrow. And, uh, and we, we may be hurting parts of the population. In teams, it's also very fun to have women because it, the atmosphere tends to be a little bit less competitive, much more relaxed. Um, people tend to be a little bit more aware of how everybody's feeling. Uh, uh, I used to work in only, only with men for, for many, many years. I was the, the, the only woman. And uh, in recent years, actually, more women have entered the field and I can't tell you how much I enjoy it. Uh, everybody relaxes just a little bit more and there's less, um, I would say there's less competitive behavior. Avoiding bias uh, every time we address a scientific problem is, has always been difficult. Let's put that first, you know, and in the past uh, we relied on human judgment and in making decisions only. And now in many fields, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning uh, is used in addition to human judgment or sometimes even solely. And of course, bias creeps in there too. Um, whether or not bias creeps in more than before, um, it's really hard to say, but we're very concerned uh, about this because whereas before uh, you knew the person who was making the decisions and you could appeal to them and talk to them and try to understand a little bit better why certain decisions were made, with artificial intelligence and machine learning algorithms it's become very impersonal. and. Um, Sometimes we don't even understand quite why we come up with certain decisions. We don't really understand how an algorithm works, <laughs> um, nor how predictions are really made. Uh, and then we don't always realize what, um, you know, what, what bias may have crept in in the data that we're, we're collecting. And actually finding that out, you know, what, what, what are biases, biases that come into the data we gather, what are biases that have come in into the way that we're, we're asking questions, the way that we're approaching answering questions is exceedingly difficult. And I think for that reason we have to be so, so careful uh, adopting uh, AI algorithms or data science uh, techniques in, uh, in critical, critical decisions, you know, in the judicial system and in, uh, in, in medicine, you know, all of this, those areas we just have to be very, very careful and, and, um, and, and look 10 times before, <laughs> before we, uh, we do this. Um, luckily, the, the, uh, the world uh, has become more aware. So uh, even five years ago, there was such a, an incredible urge and, and, and uh, uh, to, to apply AI everywhere we saw fit and uh, people were overexcited and it was a, a bit of a hype. And I think we've learned that um, uh, artificial intelligence algorithms are flawed. Of course, you know, everything we do as humans is flawed. So also the algorithms that we are designing and, and people have become more aware. So we talk about it more, uh, more often than not. Predicting unintended consequences of these algorithms is very tough. Um, so we need to test them. We need to make sure that the algorithms that we use are reproducible, meaning that if we use them, you know, in, in, on like data, on, in like populations, that the outcomes are similar. Um, and we should always compare, contrast with human judgment. You know, uh, I am not somebody who's, who's very keen on using only artificial intelligence algorithms for really important decisions, but I can see AI playing a role as a check. You know, so for example, in judicial systems, you can have judges making decisions. You can also see 
what decisions an AI algorithm may make based on the judgments of of judges over many many years, and then compare and contrast and say, hey, this is this is funny. You're you're approaching this differently than an AI algorithm would. Why? Uh, you know, let's let's think about this some more. So, in other words, it 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 could help with checks and balances, which could only be be positive. Uh, Women in Data Science started as uh, as a conference uh, only, but we very quickly saw that there was just such an incredible need of women all over the world to be engaged with each other and to learn from each other and to support each other. So um, we are extremely keen on broadening WITS. We sometimes sort of joke and say WITS is uh, no longer just a conference, it's a movement. <laughs> we are gradually expanding, so we added a datathon to get uh, more engagement also before WITS, a couple of months before WITS, which has been super fun. We started a podcast series where we're interviewing women who've appeared at WITS or, do, or who we think are really great role models here in, uh, in Silicon Valley or elsewhere in the world um, and that podcast uh, these podcast series are produced throughout the year uh, we're now looking to uh, activities with uh, high schools and maybe maybe middle schools to get uh, girls a little bit younger but we're really really keen on making with a year-round activity um, how exactly we're going to do that is it's not clear there are many organizations uh, that we can collaborate with, which is exciting. Uh, there's the women in machine learning and data science, for example, the meetups, and they, they meet on a regular basis. There are companies that have uh, year-round events that we could, uh, we could collaborate with. But, uh, you know, we actually would love your suggestions. So if you have any suggestions, send me an email. I started uh, my career uh, I always think in mathematics and uh, computational mathematics at a very young age, so at the age of 15 and 16 I chose mathematics as my main uh, interest, uh, also in high school, and I was one of the very few girls at the time. And ever since then I've really always been one of few girls, or the first woman in, uh, in any department that I've worked, and for a long time also the only one. Um, it's been tough at times, you know, I think as a, as a woman, um, when you are different, you know, when, you, when there are not many other women, uh, people notice you, that can be positive, but it can also lead to more scrutiny. So I always felt I was scrutinized uh, more than men, um, that a lot of people were critical towards me. If I made a mistake, everybody knew about it. <laughs> if I did something good, it wasn't always acknowledged. Um, and that is tough, you know, it's, uh, it's tough to, to go through and always stay uh, confident and know that despite a lack of encouragement, which I certainly uh, missed, I missed encouragement uh, when I was younger to keep going um, and have the self-confidence uh, to be okay. It got a lot easier for me um, over the years. Uh, I uh, have always had a lot of male friends. Uh, sometimes people joke so that I'm a bit of an alpha male myself, uh, with sharing a sense of humor uh, with my male colleagues. And I decided to make it easy for my male colleagues as well. And not, not easy in that I was accepting bad behavior. I never accepted bad behavior. Uh, but I also tried not to be too sensitive either and to understand that if you, when you're entering as a woman in a group of only men, for them the dynamics also changes and for them they, they also have to find uh, uh, comfort uh, with this and, um, and change, change their behavior adjust a little bit, so I've always tried to help them with it. Um, and then the other thing I've, I've done, which has helped me a lot, is I never make anything personal and I don't try to take uh, things too personal either. So if somebody makes a, a comment at me that could be a little bit insulting or uh, discouraging, I try to say, you know, mm, that's not really me that he, often he, is responding to. Um, and very often people make bad comments when, uh, when they feel a little bit threatened or they don't really understand how to deal with you. Um, so I, I try to see the positive of everything, you know, being an only woman also has advantages and um, there's no way around it. You know, people see you more and in an academic career, 
that's also important. So it, um, I never had to worry about people saying, Marco, who's she? You know, I, I knew that people would know who, who I was and would be aware of, of what I did. Um, and I've gotten some benefits of being a woman. Uh, uh, sometimes you get the benefit of the doubt a little bit. Sometimes you get the opposite. <laughs> you, uh, you lose because of doubt. But I think overall it has balanced it, it, itself out. Um, I've had some difficulties. Uh, now Me Too is a really uh, big thing. And I've certainly encountered uh, Me Too mo moments where uh, I was propositioned by people or I was groped or um, I was expected to sleep my way <laughs> uh, to success. Uh, never did that. Um, uh, but it, it's tough uh, when you are in a situation where you feel people are uh, abusing their power. And when I was younger, especially when I was a student and I would help, uh, it was, uh, was often a little tough to get, to get through. Um, I have also been in situations where I was really insulted, you know, and in hindsight, those situations are, are kind of funny. I'll tell you one story. I was uh, once in Cambridge, Cambridge in the UK, um, uh, invited to a college, and the first thing that uh, professor asked me, who was at the high table in college with me, uh, was who, who I was with. You know, professor could not imagine that I was actually the guest of honor. And when I said, well, nobody, you know, I'm here, I was invited. Um, and he then turned to me and asked me that he was very surprised that California universities hired blonde women to be professors. And, uh, and so I turned to him and I said, uh, you know, don't worry, you know, the blonde is artificial. <laughs> I get highlights. He said, don't worry, it's fa fake blonde, you know, really I'm a brunette, so everything's okay with the world. <laughs> and, you know, you have to respond sometimes in those ways to, to, you know enjoy yourself a little bit more than you otherwise would um, another time I was in a in group with men and one of the men said Margo you know it's always so easy to work with you much easier than with other women but now I understand why you know I, I it got to me I uh, I see it now I said because you're really just a man with boobs <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself my goodness you know so I started laughing and I said well I suppose I'm happy you noticed <laughs> you know but what can I say in, in such cases? You can either see it as something really funny and um, a little bit embarrassing for them. Uh, and that's how I've dealt with it. Overall, I think it's still great. You know, it's, um, and I'm so, so happy more women are, are entering the field and together we can make a, make a big difference.